All right, good morning. Man, I'm not sure what to say after that. If I've been life coaching for President Obama, that could include all sorts of great things and also maybe some problematic things. So I don't know how that life coaching is going. But, but there are other friends here. My friend Lisa came out from New Jersey to be with us. And, um, and uh, Dennis and I flew out on Thursday. We got up, at, I got up at, I think, like 4 in the morning. And, and, uh, but we've been having a great time being here the last couple of days. Um, we want to talk this morning about confession, really. Um, and so would you bow your head in prayer with me real quick before we get started? Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here with these good people. Lord, we bless your name. We ask that you would have your way with us this morning and always. And help us, Lord, to open our heart deeply to your word and to you and to one another. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, we had a great time at this marriage conference this weekend. And, um, but like we always discover when we talk with people and when we really kind of get into people's lives and people get into my life, we discover there's a lot of brokenness. And there's brokenness at my church back at home in Los Angeles, and there's brokenness here, and God is at work in all this. Where does all this come from? Let me take you back to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3, if you remember, after Adam and Eve sinned, Eve sins first, Adam right there with her. The text says, Adam sins with her. The two of them sin, and after that, they hide and they cover. Hiding and covering. This is a, both a literal biblical truth, and this is a deep, deep, like human psychological truth. Most human beings on the planet do not like to be exposed. We, we feel afraid sometimes to look on the inside. We feel afraid to examine what's really happening in our hearts. And why do we feel so afraid? Well, this is part of the consequence of sin. Um, God never made us to be able to deal with sin on our own. <coughs> so Adam and Eve hid and they covered. And what there have been many other consequences that come with the fall, and we could talk more about that. But when you start to read the Psalms, let's move a little more forward in the Old Testament, David starts to pray things like this that tell us about how we are to now relate to our own heart and to the Lord. So David says things like this in Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. David says, God, who may abide in your holy tent, on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and does righteous deeds, and speaks the truth in the heart. My friends, that is very difficult for us to do, to speak the truth, particularly about what we are broken about, what we feel ashamed about, what we're hurting over, the, 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 yeah, I'm, the thing that we learned from Adam and Eve in the garden, our mother and father, if you will, was to hide and to cover the things that we're broken about, not to open those things up, not to share them with others. David also prays in Psalm 51. He says, God, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden places, God, you will make me to know wisdom. When I work with individuals and couples, I work at a place called the Center for Individual and Family Therapy. It's a Christian counseling center in Southern California. When people come in, it's usually because they're having a crisis and they need some support. And um, I believe in preventative medicine, not just you know give people meds and support when it happens, but also trying to prevent it and trying to undo it before it explodes all over us and all over the church. And, um, but you're not gonna experience this kind of healing and this kind of transformation if you keep things hidden in the dark. Now, I don't mean you just stand up in front of a group of thousands and just start confessing your sin publicly. That is not what I mean. It's actually far more difficult to open up to one person or two or three and have an ongoing intimate relationship where you confess your failings, you confess and even share good things that are happening too. That's far more difficult than doing it in front of thousands, trust me. Um, but Psalm 139 is one of my favorite biblical texts on this. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me 
and lead me in the way everlasting. Folks, you are not going to be led into the way everlasting if you are not willing to examine the deep issues of your heart. Now, I, on one hand, I, of course, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're saved, you're headed to the way everlasting. But do you know that your forgiveness of sins is just the beginning of the work of God in your life? Too many Christian people think, well, my sins are forgiven. I got the blood. I got the blood. I've been cleansed by the blood. You know what that is? That's vampire Christianity. All I need is the blood of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. It's like getting a little tooth mark right here. I just need a little tap into the blood. Folks, that's just the start. We want to move on through the new, up to the New Testament in James chapter 5, and I'll try to illustrate this point. James chapter 5, verse 16. James says, confess your sins to one another. Why? James 5, 16. So you may be, a lot of people say forgiven. You confess, so you get forgiven. But if you look at the text carefully, James 5, 16, what does it say? So that you may be healed. Folks, do you want to take seriously those lyrics that you were singing about a few minutes ago? We will face the darkness around us. We'll break the chains that bind us. Are those just words that we sing? They did, they did inspire me. They touched me as I was sitting down over here. You will unleash the chains. Yes, it all begins with the work of Christ. Resurrection Sunday, what we talked about last week. But as the other, said, as the other song says, we release the supernatural. Do you remember this? See what we are praying for. You will release the supernatural in your life when you start living as Jesus said and as the New Testament, God's Word says. And in James 5, 16, this says, you are to be confessing to one another so that you may be healed. See, the forgiveness part has already begun. That's already begun, and in some ways your sins are already forgiven. But is there anybody in the room that doesn't need more transformation? Please raise your hand if there's anybody. How about the opposite of that? Is there anybody in here who does need more transformation? Yeah. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Thank you. A little different reaction in a different service. <laughs> you guys are, yes, you're, you're on fire. <laughs> so, um, yes, we all need more transformation, right? Graceway is doing some incredible things, and I'm so thankful to, um, to be friends with the pastors and many of the members of this church. I hope to meet more of you, but um, this is a really important thing. If you want to unleash the gospel in your community, you have got to be building deep, intimate relationships with people. Notice what I said, deep, intimate relationships with, what would I say? With people. Um, we can pray, we can sing, we can preach, we can teach doctrine, but if there are not deep relationships, not deep connections, you are going to stunt the gospel. If you want to release it, as we were singing about, you have got to get connected with people. Those Old Testament Psalms teach a lot about us opening our hearts to God and asking Him to examine our hearts and all that is, we're not replacing that, we're just saying we need that and we need this outward stretch towards people. So let's look at a couple of ways to think about applying that. First is, on the one hand, let's say that you have some sins in your life and difficulties. Some, you may have sinned against some people, and we'll talk about that in a second, but sometimes you just have to have a safe place to go. You've got to talk about it with somebody who's safe. If you've sinned against somebody who's not so safe, it might have been what precipitated some of your sin against them, and what led to that. But you've got to go to some safe people first. So my friend Jim over here, or Terry, or some other people that I've been meeting and getting to know the last year and a half, I would go there and, and, and find others that aren't on the pastoral staff too. This is not just a us to the pastor thing, right? This is us to one another. Um, good that we have these pastors that are opening and growing and whatnot, but this is for all of us in the body of Christ, right? This is not just a professional ministry thing. 
So, so you confess some of your difficulties to safe people who can love on you and care for you. Why? What does the text say? So that you may be healed. And then sometimes, and here's where we want to help you take this home this weekend. Sometimes you have hurt the person in your home. Has anybody in here who is married ever done anything that kind of hurt your spouse a little bit? Do we have anybody who's honest in the room? <laughs> yes, we have thousands, hundreds, yes. God, this is no, anybody who has children ever done anything that maybe hurt a child or disappointed them, hurt them? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? To sin is in this way after the fall is human and you need to get over, you need to get over yourself and humble yourself and confess to those that you've hurt. Here's the thing about, or I should say, the consequence of not doing that, of closing your heart off, is you're going to be containing a part of the gospel. You're going to keep part of it from breaking forth and bringing transformation and bringing healing because you're too proud and too arrogant to confess. People call me, like I said, when their marriages are exploding, when their relationships are exploding, and I'm, I'm glad they call because I want to be there. As a minister of the gospel, I want to be there to provide support. But man, please don't wait till then. Please don't wait till then. Well, I think we all need support now. Um, here's some other things you might think about. So can you think about confessing to a spouse, maybe somebody that you've criticized, somebody you maybe you've withdrawn from. I work with a lot of couples where we find one spouse or another, for whatever reason, sometimes they have a hard time connecting. And when we have a hard time connecting emotionally, it sometimes makes our spouse feel abandoned makes them feel rejected, like there's something wrong with them. And then sometimes we hurt our spouses by criticizing and hounding them, prodding them, prying them, trying to get a reaction out of them because they're so withdrawn. We sometimes sin against folks in that way too. Um, some of you are not in marriage relationships, you're single, and you have friendships where you know that you have hurt people, you, you've said hurtful things. Some of you are, are your, our children, and you've said hurtful things to your parents, maybe. Maybe you've disobeyed them in some way that's been hurtful or disrespected them. All these would be examples of things. We're just inviting you to take this home. Don't make just singing about the gospel. Don't make, as the lyric said, um, singing about, you know, facing the darkness and breaking the chains. Don't think that's going to happen apart from you cooperating with Jesus and saying, I'm going to put my pride aside and I'm going to move forward. And it's going to hurt a little bit. Nobody likes to open their heart and bring their vulnerabilities to somebody else. But you want to see a church on fire? You want to see people transformed? Start talking about what you need. Start opening your heart to one another. And this includes, again, it includes sins. This text in particular is talking about sins. But there's many other texts, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but it's not just your sins, right? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed are the humble. Um, Jesus says, bring it to me, yeah. And he also says in James 5, bring it to them, um, these Old Testament Psalms. So this morning, I want to leave you with a couple of questions and a couple of challenges. And first is, you know, if we're going to be the people of God that he's called us to be, did you guys see Newsweek magazine a week or two ago? It basically said, follow Jesus, forget the church. Follow Jesus, forget the church. Is that really possible? Do you know that the power of Jesus is in his church? And yes, we can have an individual relationship with Jesus, but you will have a very broken relationship with Jesus if you cut yourself off from his body and his people because this is where the healing and transformation happens in Jesus and in his body. And so let me leave you with this. How in the world are we supposed to build one another up when we don't even know one another deeply? When you're hiding your heart and hiding your brokenness and not sharing your sins and your struggles, how in the world are we supposed to build each other up? We're going to be flapping our lips in the breeze with one another if we don't start talking truthfully about what's going on. How can we edify one another when we don't even know where we're hurting? How can I pray for you specifically? How can I unleash the power of God 
in your life through prayer if I don't even know what to pray for because you won't say it. You won't humble yourself and say. So this is really important that, folks, you've got to start with some safe people. I wouldn't share really intimate, personal things with people that aren't safe. And we can talk about finding safe people another time. But it's really important that you think very seriously about this, as I am and as many in this church are. Um, this morning, we'd like to invite Dwayne Tate and a couple of other friends to come up. We'll start with Dwayne. But Dwayne, would you join us on the stage? Dwayne is one of many people here. Here you go. Dwayne is one of many friends here at the church who's kind of been taking this challenge, as I understand it. I met Dwayne I, probably six months ago. Um, and Dwayne, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what, what, what does this look like, kind of confession and opening your heart more honestly? What does that look like in your life? Um, the thing that was so important to me is that about six to eight months ago, I was kind of in this place in my life where things felt a little off center. And so as I began to traverse through the areas of my heart, I came alongside this swamp and it stank. This thing was rank. And as I was beginning to move away from it, my friends began to encourage me, well, let's try to fix the smell and the odor and the, the algae on top. And so what they began to do, they began to help me dredge the bottom of my swamp. And let me tell you, some of the things that began to float to the top, I had a couple dead bodies coming to the top, some glass, some, some rocks, some stones. And what we began to do is we began to remove those things and they would take them and bury them wherever they needed to be laid and they were laid to rest. And, and something began to happen as they were dredging the bottom of my swamp. My swamp wasn't a swamp, in fact. It was a spring that was stuffed and it was clogged. And as we began to work on the bottom of the swamp, the water cleared up the algae went away and then we started working on the pH balance and the testing of the water making that sure it was healthy and clean and my heart started start stopped stinking tremendously hmm. what you said is really interesting and I haven't heard you say it quite like that part but notice what he said he his friends didn't try to just get the algae off the top and sometimes in the church we do this right though we sometimes just focus on surface level behaviors stop doing this stop doing that Sounds like your friends went deeper with you, and you let them take you deeper. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Yes. It, and at first, it was awkward. You know, me and Daniel had, uh, the very first time this happened, uh, me and Daniel were doing something, and I don't remember what it was exactly, but we were sitting there, and Daniel goes, and he asked me a question. And I sat there, and I started giving this think eye, like, are you really going to ask me this? <laughs> or really? So I answered the question and the relief of letting that go, knowing that it was in a safe place and I didn't have to carry that burden anymore was astounding. Yeah. Unfortunately, often in the church, right, when we don't really ask those questions, in the first service, Dwayne talked about the kind of the Christian PR that we do. What is Christian PR? Will you tell us again? Um, Christian PR is trying to be friendly but keeping it moving at the same time. You know, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Exit stage left. You know, Exit stage left, yeah. Just kind of staying on the surface, not being willing to open up deeply again with safe people. Uh, but that Christian PR is killing us, folks. Thank God the gates of hell are not going to prevail over the church, but we've got to do our part, right? And I hear you saying, I'm doing that. And how is it impacting your life? whether relationships or anything in ministry or anything with you and the Lord, how is it impacting your life to be more open and honest it, about what's happening in your heart? It has helped me realize that the Lord is about dismantling those things in my own heart so that I can be more effective in his ministry. It has helped to integrate my compartmentalized life hmm. and try to fuse those together to be one so that I'm more transparent hmm. and consistent on all levels. Wow. Will you uh, thank him for sharing with us? Thank you, buddy. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, yeah, I'm sharing and I'm, you know, doing all this and I just feel better as a person because it's all about me and I just want to feel more fulfilled. He said it's helping him in his ministry. It's helping him in the work of expanding God's kingdom. Um, will you please welcome up Daniel and Tylena? They're going to share with us.
All right, so Daniel is also a gentleman that I've gotten to know probably in the what, last six or eight months, um, and I hope to get to know better. But um, Daniel, could you say a little bit about, a little bit to us, what this has kind of been looking like in your life? And then I want to ask Tylena, is his girlfriend? And um, why'd you laugh about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm interested on the impact of what's happening in Daniel's life and how that's impacting your guys' relationship and maybe even your own growth. So would you begin? Yeah, um, no problem. For me, uh, before I started doing this processing and everything, you know, uh, going into the relationship, it was all head knowledge and what I thought she wanted. You know, it was all about, ooh, maybe I should do this. Mm. And if I do this, then this is going to happen. And if this happens, oh, okay. You know, and so it was all the head knowledge that I had. And for example, okay, I go and get flowers. Why? You know, just, just because. And I go and get flowers. So my thinking, I'm thinking she's going to react, oh, how sweet. Okay, brownie points. And so um, that's what I thought was going to happen. But, you know, I get the flowers. And then she's like, um, what's this for? And I'm just like, oh, yeah, I got it on sale. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But um, that's what happened. And so what, what the processing helped me do what the process and helping me do was realize that this ain't about head knowledge or like now the things that I do <coughs> and interacting with her all comes from the heart and so it's more of instead of trying to think what's how she's going to react like knowing in the heart like the things that I want to do now I do to make her feel cherished in all this and, and so that's basically what um, how it helped me to, uh, to grow in that aspect. Okay, let me make sure I'm understanding here. So are you saying before you used to kind of think about what the right thing to do was, but now you're, you're sharing more of your heart with her? True. Could, could you say the part about the, uh, the, the need, or was that the part she talked about? That's that, the part. Okay, all right. I just thought that was beautiful. <laughs> Tylena, bring it home. Come on. <laughs> How's this impacting you? Well, like I had mentioned before, Richard, I feel like I'm in an interview on CNN. No, but basically, uh, when like maybe like five or six months after we started dating, I was like feeling super, I don't know, there was like something empty. And I was like, I feel like I need him, but I don't feel like it's reciprocated. And so I met up with him one night and I was like, hey, here's a deal. I need to tell you something. I was like, I feel like I need you. And then I like listed every single way that I needed him. I was like, I feel like I need affirmation. I need like, so I'm like, let's do all these things. And I was like, but I don't feel like you like I feel like you need me but you don't really like need me need me and this is what he said this true story he's like um I don't really need anything <laughs> and I was like <clears throat> you don't need anything, you know? So I was like, okay, well, in my head, I was like, well, if he doesn't need anything, that means he doesn't need me. And so I was like starting to like withdraw from the relationship, honestly, like in the inside. Actually, we took a hiatus, a little break. But then after that, um, he had went through like some group counseling, if you will, like some group session stuff. And when he came back, he had like got me this book that I wanted, but inside of it, it was like this paper. And I was like, I swear, if this is a receipt, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> and so I, I picked the paper out and it was a letter. And I was like, the heck, you know, like Daniel doesn't write anything, you know? So I opened this letter and it's super long, first of all. And then at the bottom of it had like some bullet points. And so like the context of it was basically, it was like an apology, but at the end it was like, and by the way, I need, and then it had like maybe maybe 10, 15 bullet points, like things he needed, like, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, yeah. but he listed them in there. And I was just like, wow, like that is surprising. So it just made me feel like I was more, I, I was able to share my heart more and like I didn't have to be as guarded cause I'm like, actually we need each other, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's how his little spiel, how it's how, affected our relationship. How his growth, it sounds like, sounds like yeah. you're saying Daniel and his personal work, his growth and being a man, opening his heart, taking a look at his wounds, his issues, having good friends like Dwayne, that that's translating over into how he's connecting with you. Right. Before you felt some pain, he doesn't need me, he doesn't, mm -hmm. and, and now you're feeling a deeper connection, that sounds right. like. That's good stuff. Thanks. Thanks you guys for sharing. Yeah. Will you give them applause? Thank you. I see this all the time, and it's not just with men. I see this with women, too. But sometimes when men and women, their hearts are shut down, when you've got, like Dwayne was talking about, when you've got stuff in your swamp that's kind of stinking things up, 
it really impacts your partners. And I think ultimately this is everyone, right, on the planet because we all have sin, we all need grace. So, but I really appreciate you guys being honest about that. And I, I hope you can see that this is not just about individual fulfillment. This is about becoming more like Christ for his, as Dwayne talked about, for the sake of God's kingdom growing and also, as we're seeing, it impacts relationships. It helps love grow. Would you please welcome uh, Jim Lee. Jim, come share with us a little bit. Jim, as you know, is on the staff here at the church. And Jim, how is, how is being more um, kind of looking at your own heart and bringing your heart to safe others with your wounds or sins, how's that been impacting your life? Well, I'll tell you, one of the ways uh, that has radically changed in my life, you know, you've been speaking from James chapter 5, 16, and confess your faults to one another, pray for one another, you may be healed. And, you know, in the past, I've always viewed that verse, you know, in the sense that you got a big sin, you've been dealing with it for 10 months, maybe you better tell somebody. It's kind of how that operated in my life. In the last couple of years, my understanding of James 5, 16 has radically changed. Now, I bring all my stuff. I bring it to the Lord, and when I have these, these things, which I have on a weekly basis, roughly, you know, <laughs> okay, at least a monthly basis, I bring those to friends who are able to help me process through and get healing and help in prayer for that. So that's changed me radically. I'll tell you, one of the ways that has re really changed in practically is, is how I deal with my kids. And I'm so thankful that I've had this experience in the last couple of years um, and learned what I had in the last couple of years when I did because, you know, I just had a, a situation a few weeks ago with one of my boys and one of my sons struggles with a mild form of dyslexia. So when it comes to reading or writing, I mean meltdown, okay? We'll just have a meltdown. We went to a new school this year. We're at the kitchen table and we're doing our reading and our writing at the table, and here's what he does. He's sitting there and he's like, <laughs> well, okay, let me tell you how a couple years ago, if this had happened, how I would have dealt with this. Here's what I would have done. I would have said, hey, hey, look at me, look at me, stop it. Get back to work. No, 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 stop. Stop it. Do what I ask you to do right now. Do it. I said, stop. Listen, if you're not going to stop. Okay, so what I would have been used to growing up is stop it or I'll jerk a knot in your tail. That's what I would have been used to, okay? Is that, or Does that mean kind of like get the snot kind of yanked out of you or something like that? <laughs> it's not good whatever it means, it is not good, okay? <laughs> so I know or the snot part. you stop crying or... Oh my god. Did gosh. you go up in my house? <laughs> How do we know this? Okay, so, but, but listen, but listen, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm saying if I go that route. Here's what I'm saying to my son. I'm saying, disconnect with your heart. Stop feeling. Learn to be a Pharisee and operate outside the realm of how you really are. So let me tell you, I handled it a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, meltdown, okay, melt, this whole thing. So... I said, oh, sweetie, you're having a tough time, aren't you? I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. You, you look really frustrated. And yeah, yeah, I said, man, I, I got to tell you, I've been so frustrated, too. I, I know exactly how you feel. I've been in that boat a bunch of times. Can I pray for you real quick? Okay, come here, boy. And I pull up next to him. I put my arm around him. I start praying for him. I just say, God, would you please bless him? Would you encourage his heart? I know he's having a tough time. Would you help him? So I minister to him, pray to him, and I finish, and I'm like, hey, you ready to get back to work, or do we need to take a break? You want to take a break? What do you think? Can we take a break? Can, can we go snuggle and watch Swamp People? <laughs> Absolutely. 
So we, we go snow, we take a 10 minute break, we watch Swamp People for 10 minutes, which by the way, it's a great show, okay. <laughs> and then we come back and he is engaged and everything is okay. And he, I, he's operating with a full heart. Very different than what I would have done in the past. See, Jim, you had an opportunity to pour garbage down his heart and help him to feel more shame about his difficulties. Or you, it sounds like you're saying, I tried to tune into my son's heart and love on him, accept him, pray with him. And notice what his boy was able to do. He was able to return to the task and keep moving forward. This is so huge. Can you say a little bit about how is this impacting, like, your marriage? Um, what is you being more in touch with your own heart and having confessional relationships and friendships? How is that impacting the way that you relate to your wife? I'll tell you one way which has been a big deal has been, it used to be in the past, my wife would come to me and, and she'd say, Jimmy, are you... Are you mad at me? And I'd be like, no, I'm not mad. I'm fine. And I was. I was totally fine. I was not mad. I was not anything. But I really was. It was just under the surface. And I wasn't, I wasn't being totally real with myself. And so... What I've learned in the process of all this is how to deal with and how, honestly, and this is a way that some people can maybe connect with this, but I've, I've been learning how to do Bible with my heart. That's, what, that's James 5.16. Could you say more about that? That sounds really important. How do you do Bible with your heart in, in your marriage or in your... The way you do Bible with your heart is you do what the Bible says when it talks about how we're supposed to go there with our faults with our sins, which does so easily beset us. I think one of the ways we lay aside every weight, Hebrews chapter 12, and the sins which does so easily beset us is we bring it before people that we know we can count on that can pray for us and help us. And so with my wife now, what's different is I'll be, you know, well, it used to be, I'd come home after work and, and my wife would say, um, you know, hey, how's it going? How did, how did your day go? And I'd say, um, good, 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 good. Well, the reality was, no, it probably went horrible. Um, and, but I'll be honest with you, the last thing I want to do is relive that by telling her again, right? And that's what ladies, you know, that's kind of where the guys are sometimes. We just don't want to have to go through it again. So my wife would say, well, so tell me about your day. Oh, tell me about it. I'd be like, oh, where's my day timer? Oh, oh there it is. <laughs> Open it up. Boom. Okay. I had a meeting with so-and-so. I got this done, this done, this done, and I finished up the project that I was working on that. Okay? And my wife was not digging that. Surprisingly. Because what my wife wanted was my heart. She wanted to know how I felt about those things. She wanted to connect with me on that level. And so that has done wonders for us. Because now my wife feels like she knows me. I feel like I know myself better. And we are going places in our relationship that we've never been able to go before. Very healthy, very free. Wow. Amen. Thank you, brother, for sharing right. with us. Okay, folks, just in closing... Connecting hearts, right? This is not just something that women need. This is not just something that men need. This is something that God made every human being on the planet to need. For those of you that have children, have been around a lot of children, um, and granted there may be a few exceptions here and there with various cases, but do children have healthy needs sometimes? Do they need attachment? Do they need closeness? Do they need connection? They need their parents to tune in deeply to their hearts. Kids need parents who are not perfect, but parents that keep trying, want to keep tuning in. And so much of this we see, I see in my work when I'm working with couples or individuals, is sometimes a lot of human brokenness occurs when we feel really unknown in our hearts. And when you hide and you cover, you're living in the fall. 
When you open your heart deeply, you are living in resurrection life. The possibility for forgiveness of sins is there. Thank God for the work of Christ by the Spirit. And the work of the body, James 5.16, to be doing some healing and transformation in you. That is also possible. Folks, confession leads to healing. Healing leads to more love and more connection with others, with your friends, with your spouses, with your children, even with your enemies, even with your neighbors, some of them. And uh, ironically enough, Jesus says, you know what? You know how the gospel is going to be spread? You know how his kingdom is going to be spread? They will know us by... One more time. They will know us by our love. If you shut down the healing, if you shut down the transformation, they will not be knowing us by our love. Um, Jeff, would you come and share with us, how do we take this home a little bit more and how can we get some more support in this? Thank you, Richard, and everyone who shared. I'm going to ask you a question. It's a simple question. Have you been to church? You haven't. You've been to a party church. And you've been to the model of Christianity and Western civilization, which is you've been to a lecture. And I'm not saying God hasn't moved, and I'm not saying you haven't learned some things. Paul told the Philippians this. You don't have to turn there. He said, those things which you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me, do. Take it home. What is it? I think some of you, if you were honest, there's something in all of these stories that probably you could relate to. That's why we have them share. I mean, I'm going to share a testimony because I have a limited amount of time. I promise you, if I would have learned to share with Debbie that I had needs instead of just being the guy to suck it up, which is what Daniel and Tylene are sharing, just dating, if I would have learned that, it would have helped my marriage tons. Well, Jim's sharing his story. It's funny. I mean, I'm laughing too, but, you know, some of you are laughing, but you're thinking, that's what my dad would have said to me. Suck it up, get on with it. Or even, if you're really honest, some of you are, well, he's talking and he says, well, I would have said to my son, you know, come on. You're thinking, yeah, that's what you, oh, wait, that was the wrong answer. And what we do is we come, we learn, we see, we see it modeled in other people. But where we struggle is how do we really do this? And the point Richard's really making is you can't do it by yourself. You need other people. So here's the reality, the unpolitical correct, correct thing to say. I know what church is in Western Christianity in the United States of America for a lot of people. Show up here, a lecture, go home. And it doesn't mean we're not glad you're here. Please don't take it that way. But I want to tell you something. You haven't done church yet. Church is where you're intentional about getting in relationships to get help. Not to get forgiven. You're forgiven. I'll assume you're saved. To get healing and growth and a more abundant life. Take it home. There's really two points to it. And this is the philosophy we keep going through. Number one is going to apply biblical principles to the most intimate relationships in our lives. Take it home means I'm going to take this sermon I just heard or numerous sermons, and I'm actually going to take it home and apply it to the relationships in my life. This all means this. Viewing the home as the primary place where spiritual growth is nurtured, meaning where Debbie and I, my wife, are really going to grow and be nurtured is not coming to church, although that will help and we'll be equipped, and obviously I make a living doing this, so I'm not dogging it, okay? But you know where? In our homes. Where your children's spiritual growth will truly be nurtured is not you dropping them off, and the average fourth grader, we'll talk about it next week, will get about 48 hours of church interaction over the course of a year. You, the parent, will give them 3,000. It's the home's the place where that happens. So you sit here and you listen to this day and you think, I wish I could relate to my spouse better. I wish I could relate to my friends better. I wish I had community. I wish I had a place where I could be vulnerable. I wish I spoke to my kids in that way. I wish I had more wisdom. I wish I had more help. I wish I had friends like Dwayne. I wish I had all that. So here's the do part. 
Here's where it gets practical. Next week, Sunday evening, the 22nd, and then the following two Sundays, the 29th and the 6th, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock in room 225, that's right over here, we're going to have a place where we're going to get together and talk about how our immaturity has affected the relationships in our lives. Now, this is very careful. If you're sitting here thinking, yeah, I need to come to that so my spouse can learn how their immaturity has affected me, <laughs> you know, I'm going to sign Debbie up this week. There's really some good things you need to learn from Jim. You know, that would not work. But you know what would work? If I would be transparent and honest and vulnerable enough to say, you know what, just coming and hearing the sermon isn't all I need. I need people around me. And we want at Graceway to be the church that provides the bridge so you can do that. So the first step would be come next Sunday night. There's no cost to this. You don't sign up. There is no child care for this, though. But you have to be intentional about that happening in your life. So I challenge you to do that. If you just hear it, because here's what happens a lot of times. You just hear it and said, well, I'll just go home and apply that myself. That wasn't New Testament Christianity. Our obsession is that we have, I like what Richard said, how many times did I hear God, personal relationship with God, personal relationship with God, personal relationship with God. And that is true, but it's also true that we're a community of people that follow God together, which means we need people. Something else about take it home. How serious are we about a church? We want to be a church that um, teaches kids to love God and equips parents to do that. About a year ago, it was on my heart and other leaders at our church, our executive team, our board, what else do we need at Graceway to be more effective in doing this? All models of ministry, and come next week to hear more of this, all models of ministry really have this entirely segregated approach where the kids go over here, the students go over here, the adults go over here. We do church completely separate. And we just got frustrated with that. And we realized that we as a team needed somebody else on our team. And we began to pray and interview and do vetting and all of those things. And, and involved in the process, I talked to different people, and we were interviewing people to bring on to our staff. And I really am confident God brought me to a man that when I talked about these kinds of things, take it home, doing different models of ministry, church in a different way, he connected us. And it's no surprise, it's already in your bulletin if you saw it, but uh, John Baxter is going to be moving from Virginia to come be on our staff. He's going to be the executive director over student and children's ministry. He's gonna oversee uh, preschool, elementary, middle school, high school, kind of an umbrella over all that, and not just for the kids, but to be more effective interacting with um, um, the parents in the training. So we're gonna have John come on up with his beautiful family, and I want you to welcome him to Graceway here. And um, he will not actually be moving here until July because he has some other commitments, but I want to just give him a second this morning to introduce his family to you and just share how God kind of worked in his heart to bring him to Graceway. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Graceway, for such a warm welcome. Um, this entire weekend has been phenomenal, and we're so impressed. I'd like to introduce you to my family. This is my wife, Ann. She's holding our youngest, Jack. This is our oldest daughter here, Georgia. This is Jenny, and this is Dakota. And they're already wearing KC jerseys when they're not dressed like this. So <laughs> we, uh, we've been so excited to get here, so excited to meet each of you. And God has confirmed over and over and over again uh, what we're meant to do here. And uh, so much so that even the last conversation I had with Jeff before we came out here, um, within a week of that, someone walked up to us, said, we'd like to buy your house. And uh, in this market, that's definitely a miracle. <laughs> And uh, yesterday, we actually signed a contract on a house here in the Kansas City area. So those are just two things that God's already shown that his hand is at work. And uh, if he's willing to do that, we're very excited to see what he's willing to do here at Graceway and very passionate about pulling families and their children together and look forward to taking it home with you. Thank you. When you see them, greet them, love on them. In a few months here, the girls will be here and Jack and just love on them. A lot of them, you teach, you teach Sunday school classes and stuff, you'll have them in there, so really make them feel welcome. I'm going to have the praise team come back out, and we're going to close in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, I love you.